Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Apologize for the little bit of the delay there. Just uh, had to navigate through some technical issues. So really excited to be presenting to you today. We're going to be talking about investigations in a digital age, specifically social media surveillance. Uh, really privileged to be speaking with uh, Lorenzo Lisi, longtime friend of the company. Uh, Lorenzo is a partner at Airden Bearless, and I'll let Lorenzo uh, kick it off and introduce himself, and then I'll jump in. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, my name is Lorenzo Lisi. I'm a labor and employment lawyer. I, I practice on behalf of management clients. I've been doing this for quite some time, and uh, this is a, a topic of particular interest in the labor and employment world. Um, because social media and how it interacts with the workplace touches on just about everybody. Uh, so I think uh, this is a timely topic, and when we combine this with uh, how we deal with issues of breaches of uh, confidentiality or obligations towards the company and, and how the surveillance works, uh, this is a very topical and timely uh, 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 seminar. Yeah, I agree, Lorenzo. So from, uh, from my perspective, uh, my background is with uh, policing, Spent a number of years with Toronto Police, uh, jumped out and ran the investigative arm of Target and helped stand that up. And then I uh, jumped over to AFI Mac. And my role now is to lead the investigative arm of the company across all business lines. And uh, to Lorenzo's point, uh, there's not one investigation that I've been personally involved with over the past four or five years that hasn't had some element of workplace social media or social media in general. So. Um, I think it's uh, fantastic to, to get the perspective of a labor lawyer, but um, as well we can talk through the investigative component of social media, which is becoming very commonplace. So in terms of an agenda, what we're going to be taking you through today, and we'll, we will uh, definitely dedicate some time at the end uh, for questions, and then we will also send a questionnaire out at the end of this uh, webinar if you have to jump off for whatever reason or uh, you're not able to get a question in. So we're going to be talking through what is social media, what the definition of social media is, some high-level statistics around usage of social media, and the change workplace, which Lorenzo touched on uh, briefly. We're also going to be talking through managing social media in the workplace, so the strategies and approaches, um, and then also privacy and use of information, which is very, very uh, topical for clients, and if you always want to know how do we navigate through this, uh, through this landmine of uh, privacy which is very commonplace in Canada and both the U.S., as we know. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, big, the big issue for employers uh, is how do you deal with situations where, uh, as a result of uh, social media, there is employee misconduct? Uh, we've probably all seen examples of this in our own workplace, whether they're postings. It used to be email and comments that were on email, and that's far too simple now. Now we've got... Uh, we can, we can have comments that uh, either through uh, LinkedIn or Instagram, uh, through Facebook, can get out there very quickly and can't come back. And the problem for employers is dealing with employees who let that information out, breaches of confidentiality, all of those kinds of things, which are now issues for employers that never used to be. So how do we deal with it? Well, uh, we're going to look at the investigation and discipline process and then also some termination issues and also look at you know, uh, Craig will go into the social and uh, media investigation lifestyle, and then we'll talk about some best practices, policy considerations, and tips. Uh, in terms of uh, definition of uh, social media, we know this is a, a pretty sim simple one, is a collection of online platforms and tools. Uh, so you can use that, but really what I tell most clients is it is just the way employees communicate. And we don't even have to just look to millennials. This is the way employees are communicating. Sometimes they're doing it with each other outside of work. Sometimes they're doing it while they're at work. But social media, with whatever components it is, uh, it constitutes social media, and that's very broad. Right? All of these things are how people communicate now. It is the source of communication. It is both a tool and also a potential liability for many companies. And I think that's why it's become so important. So it's the platform or the tool. It's the way people speak. It's the, it's the method by which they get their message out there. All right? And it's the act of connecting. So what that means is when, when businesses look at social media as a tremendous boon in terms of marketing, the potential, I mean, what we're doing right now, we're getting through, you know, we're getting through social media. We're getting, the, we're getting this, this seminar out there. Do you want to listen to us talk? It's the way we market. We also want our employees to market. 
But we want them to understand that when they're doing that, okay, when we're joining the conversation, there are there are traps. That's one of the things where the that's where the law comes in. That's where employee misconduct comes in. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to show you just a brief video um, encapsulating the usage of social media present day. And uh, like Lorenzo mentioned, it's a, it's really truly a form of communication. Uh, now in the workplace and outside the workplace. And this video really captures that well.
so pretty compelling video there. I think it's uh, pretty evident to see that social media intertwines with basically every facet of our lives. So from the workplace to your personal life. So it's just a matter of not whether you're going to avoid the train, but how do you get on the train and how do you manage it through the workplace and through your everyday life? So a little bit about statistics. And I thought that video was extremely interesting, both in terms of some of the facts that they threw at you. But the most important thing is, is that it's not a fad, it's a different way of communicating. It's the way we communicate. And if you look at some statistics, and I love statistics, which is why we put them in here, uh, that boomers and bo boomerangs are huge, huge um, users of, uh, uh, of online media. And we know that uh, simply because they are the ones actually in, in charge for the most part of, of advertising and media budgets. And we know that that's who they're trying to hit demographically, although that's changing uh, with millennials. The funny thing about millennials is they really only know this world. And that's really different when you, it's a complete, you have to think outside the box when you're now dealing with how millennials think, both in terms of products, uh, in terms of uh, economics, and in terms of work. It's a very, very different environment. Uh, the statistics are, uh, you saw some of them in the video, these are just more of them, but uh, when you look at the amount of, of, uh, of different platforms that you can use on social media, there is a choice. But the choice is really, um, it, is, it is not one necessarily that is, is, is brand specific. Uh, particularly millennials use whatever comes that works for them. If it's Instagram, if it's Snapchat, that's what they're using. You'll see some millennials starting to get out of the, out of the Facebook. Uh, we see some statistics starting to trend, but as many are coming back in. So it really is a matter of what works for them, what reaches them, and what connects with them. Now, how does that impact the workplace? Well, we know a couple things. Uh, we know that the use of social media uh, can be a drag on productivity. We know that for a fact. We saw this, like I said, when email came in. We saw that when internet uh, access was allowed in the workplaces, that productivity numbers went way down. But more, inf more importantly, uh, it's not only that they're doing other things, it's uh, what are they doing on social media while they're working. Uh, are, they provide, are they sending out information about the company, about themselves, which can damage the company, which in some way uh, uh, impacts on the, on the uh, uh, reputation of the company? Are they providing information through social media that is really unnecessary for other people to know? And most importantly, you know, is that information related to their job for the company? You know, we saw that with the, 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 uh, the Toronto uh, FC soccer fan who got fired uh, after the City TV reporter took him on. Now, is that just cause at, at, at law? No, it's not. What he was doing was both you know, uh, was in his own time, that was a discussion which he was not a representative of Ontario Hydro, but Hydro believed that that damaged their reputation with the community, so they terminated him, right? Not fair, but that happens to be the way things work sometimes. So media and what gets out there can be disparaging, right? And more importantly, and this is what we find with a lot of employees, they're not thinking when they post these things. And that's incredibly important because that can lead to liability. Those comments can be used in litigation. So how do we manage this in the workplace? Well, uh, a total ban, which is what some employers used to do, say you can't use any social media on our platform, doesn't really work. Because if you don't do it there, they're going to do it on their phones, quite frankly. Even if it's a company phone, they'll do it on their phones. So you're going to be dealing with millennials who are going to all of a sudden be pretty upset at the fact that now they can't have access during the date of their social media site was. So how do you deal with Gen, with, with, with Gen Y and millennials when that's a big part of how they communicate? It is how they communicate. You're going to lose them around the workplace. You're not going to attract competitive clients and, or competitive uh, employees. So we need a social media, media policy but which, is, which assesses the value of letting employees use them but within specific parameters. That's incredibly important in this discussion. Yeah, one thing I would add to that too, Lorenzo, is we've um, – we found through my different uh, clients that we service and even my tenure at Target, there were a lot of folks in the marketing advertising space that needed to use social media. So sometimes it's a true function of their work as well, and it's just that having that tight policy is so critical. So when we look at just a few more statistics here, and the one, the one uh, statistic that I saw in that video which, which really kind of floored me is that 50% of the population was under 30. Uh, so when you look at the use of mobile phones, this is obviously skewing towards a younger and younger populace. Uh, I know, you know, I've got three boys, I've got one 15, 
the youngest, and he's had his phone for for a little bit longer than his older brothers did. Uh, and that is just because that's trending with the accessibility and the affordability of mobile phones and plans, particularly with with uh, with uh, the way it's been going in Canada, and hopefully driving down costs further. You're going to get younger and younger people using having access to that technology. Um, in the next slide, we look at uh, uh, you know the increase in use by age group. Well, of course, you see the millennials that are way up there. But what's really uh, I think uh, interesting about this as well is that the age group of you know the 30 to 49 and even the 50 to 64 has been steadily rising. So these are people who are coming into it, people who would not normally be comfortable with that kind of media, but are also getting into the game because that's the way that you communicate. Uh, and when you look at online adults who use uh, these types of social media, you can see it's also on the in, uh, on the increase. Uh, LinkedIn is an incredible tool, but it's also a dangerous tool for many employers who are losing employees. So if you're, you've got somebody who's migrating uh, and you're worried about competition issues, about solicitation issues, LinkedIn can actually be a very, very vibrant area for them to go and look once they leave one company and go to another, and it's a real problem for a lot of employers. So how do we manage uh, social media in the workplace? Well, practically we know we're not going to, uh, we're not going to ban it from the workplace, but we need to understand what are the parameters of use, and those can often be set out in a social media policy. Uh, a lot of companies want their employees to use social media. It's a good thing. It gets the name out. But how do we make sure it's done safely and without liability? There are human rights concerns here. Uh, there are more and more cases between uh, at labor arbitration and before the courts where discrimination uh, is being based in comments that were posted on social media, whether it's in Facebook, uh, whether it's a comment that uh, was distributed through Instagram. Uh, these are now areas that employers have to work that they're worried that their employees may, they may be liable vicariously for something their employee says on social media. So ethically, we want to make sure that we treat everybody the same, but we also want to make sure that we're, we're, we understand that comments that get out into the ether through social media can still be attributed to the company. All right? We don't want our employees saying things that are going to bounce back against the company. All right? To risk that liability, we want to have a well-defined, openly distributed policy, which again, balances how you want the employee to use social media. How to, you know, some, some social media policies are a page. Some are 50 pages. Depends how you want your employees to use them. Uh, technology companies want to recruit and they want to get their name message out there via their via social media. They want their employees in the conversation. More traditional companies may not. Where's your balance? That's what you're going to find in the social media policy. So we've got some legal guidelines, which are Freedom of Information Acts, and we've also got, got um, uh, privacy legislation, which is federal and in some provinces. But remember, when we're talking about commercial activities which go over borders, we're going to have privacy legislation which applies anyway. In Ontario, we don't have employment privacy legislation, but most employers in Ontario still have privacy policies which, which impact them. So how do we deal with moving from privacy, you know, where we know what our obligations are, to uh, use of information within the workplace? Well, we know that um, employees tend to expect that whatever they do, whether they're on blogs, on Facebook, or Twitter, are fair game. That's my information. You can't get to it. All right? That's my personal time. We know that's not the case. We know because, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, the Gomeshi saga and, and, and other uh, uh, legal cases which come up, that what they say in social media might actually draw fire or might cause the company liability. So what are the illegal social media activities? Well, we know we've talked about human rights legislation. When you disparage somebody or uh, another individual online, that can lead to, uh, uh, to, a type, to, to, a, to liability, whether it be um, uh, through a, a suit uh, as a result of the, the damages arising from that disparagement. And we know that breaches of privacy, breaches of confidential information and copyrighted intellectual property, they are really easy to get out there, and they can happen by accident. I've done cases where employers have employees who are doing media interviews and will inadvertently through, you know, through a blog or through, and they will inadvertently uh, give up confidential or private information about products, which can be devastating if it's done improperly. So what's permissible? Well, with Facebook
Facebook content, tweets, and blog posts which do not directly affect the workplace, those are generally fine. All right? An employer could still terminate if they find that you, they, they didn't like what you said, but that terminate would, termination would be without cause. All right? Or content that promotes the company in accordance with the company's goals and directives. All right? That's very important. If you're within the boundaries, if you're playing within the fences, that's not a permissible activity. What's not permissible? Well, we know that um, if, it's, if it's an indirect or a direct uh, impact to the workplace or the employer, that can be problematic. Derogatory or def defamatory information is not permissible. And policy should set that out, all right? If there's a breach of the du duty of faith and fidelity, for example, that means that you may have an executive, for example, that says something which is inappropriate in social, in social media, or an employee who says that. Those are actionable, all right? Or if it violates confidentiality agreements, intellectual property agreements, those are actionable. All right? Really important that we know that dis distinction. So, good, good quote here. An employee, uh, an employee is free to do whatever he likes, he or she likes, during his non-working time, and his social media comments are none of the employer's business. Generally true, but if that comment poses a threat to the employer's business interests, then they become the employer's business because they open up the employee to the threat of discipline or discharge. Right? That is the dis distinction. These lines cross, folks. They're not always clean lines. Sometimes they're blurry, sometimes they're gray, but they cross. So what you think is always in the purview of your private home. The comments you make if they get out into the social media ether can attract liability either to yourself or to the employer. So how do we deal with that? We deal with, this, with, with social media breaches the same way we've dealt with any policy breaches. We investigate. All right? What does our policy say? What does it say about, uh, about comments that are made uh, outside the workplace? What does it say about comments that are made uh, or what type of permissible communication is allowable under the policy? So the first thing you do is you look to your policy. You look then to, it's no different than doing a harassment investigation. What discipline, if any, is appropriate? Look to your policies. Deal with the communication followed because remember, if you've got millennials, you know, they're not going to be happy about somebody being, being disciplined as a result of something they said on social media. Be consistent. And sometimes, like the Ontario Hydro situation, you may not have cause, but you may decide that a termination for bad judgment is appropriate because you don't want to be affiliated with that employee uh, and their comments on social media. Craig? So what we'll do now is we'll kind of walk you through the social media investigations life cycle. So Lorenzo um, talked through the social media policy, how important that is, and how you fall back on that when you're mitigating your risk or something comes up that you have to deal with. What we've done is, um, from an investigative standpoint, what our clients are commonplace or are, are doing now if they don't have robust social media investigations platforms is they're going out to the internet, they're harvesting all that information, they're enriching the information either through screenshots, etc. And then they're analyzing that information and then acting upon that. That can be an extremely arduous and time-consuming task. What we have done is we've tried to streamline that process for clients. Now, this process was really born out of clients coming to us, coming to my investigative team across the, the globe, quite honestly, and saying, look, how do we get better at mining social media? What are we doing to, um, to monitor employees on a proactive basis? And what can we do to mitigate the risk once we figure out that something's come up that we need to action? The three products that we offer at, uh, at AFI Mac, social media footprints, social media surveillances, and physical surveillances. And I'll walk through each component. But the takeaway here from this slide is we don't start with physical surveillance. I alluded to the fact that every investigation that I've been involved with over the past four to five years has had an element of social media investigations. So what's, what that's done for the investigative side of our house is it's flipped our business model on its head in the sense that we don't start with physical surveillance, where previously we might deploy an investigator or we might have an investigator doing a tabletop investigation to try and figure out or glean information. We actually start with the social media footprint now. Now, the social media footprint, what that does is it casts a net over the Internet and it reports back against 10 major social media channels. So that's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Flickr, Google, 
Pinterest, and blogs. What we do is we capture a moment in time of that person's profile or that group's profile. So uh, Lorenzo and I have both dealt with unions, um, so that's groups that we can monitor. We can monitor individuals. It can be um, a person, group, place, etc. What we also do is we bump up keywords against those search parameters. So we put in rudimentary information like name, date of birth, if we have that address, uh, etc. And then we can bump up certain keywords that make sense for what you're looking for. So if it is an accident benefit claim, it might be run, kick, punch, drive. If it's a brand implication case, it could be whatever your company's name is, derogatory comments, human rights, and, and really the gamut is pretty widespread here. What we do then is we turn around this report in a 24-hour uh, time span, and it's a curated report that captures all that person's social media feeds or that group's social media feeds. It hyperlinks to their respective social media websites, and it captures their last 10 posts. Um, it also captures uh, pictures, high-level pictures of their profiles so that you, the client, can look at that and say, yay or nay, this is someone um, that is accurate to what we're looking for, or this is something that we need to take a little bit further. So the results look like this. So you've got social media feeds on the left-hand side of the screen. So those are the major sources where we're finding uh, presence present day with all the investigations that we're undertaking. We also include a hyperlink. We do include uh, kind of tips and tricks before you navigate through our report and start clicking on these hyperlinks to avoid detection. So what that means is we tell you to sign out of your LinkedIn profile, not necessarily like something that you see on a YouTube video, because that could draw detection to yourself. So we try to do this in, a mo in the most covert fashion that we can. We also throw in a parameter there that shows you how many posts this person or group has had over the past month. This gives you an idea, is the person active? Are they active right now? Is this something that we need to look at a little bit closer? We also throw in number of contacts. So in a workplace setting, this could be other employees that are involved. It could also be witness identification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We bake in a confidence level rating, and essentially what that is is an algorithm that we throw in um, against the information that we're mining. So a three-star confidence level rating could be a picture that you've provided my team ahead of time. We've done this social media mining, and we've found the person. We see the picture. It matches with the name, et cetera. We know dead to right it's that person. That's a confidence level rating of three. And then it goes down to two and one. Two might be we have a picture of the person, but the name is spelled different. One could be an example of we just have a name, but we don't have a picture to corroborate that information. So that's the social media footprint side of things. Now, once we've established that, we've set that foundation of now we know what that person is doing on the Internet, what their footprint looks like on the Internet. We move to the next level product, with this, which is a social media surveillance. Now, the social media surveillance, what we do there is we take that baseline information and then we monitor that individual or group across the social media channels that we've identified over a 30-day period. Now that happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's a very powerful technology. So in my, um, in my work career, uh, on both sides of the fence, in policing and in uh, private security, this can be a very time-consuming task for an analyst, HR representative, et cetera, to sit there and actually pull information on a 24-hour basis or even a, you know, one one time in your day as a routine can be very arduous. So we've automated that. We harvest all that information. The report looks very, very similar to the social media footprint. We include all the links um, to their particular posts. And we also flag the keywords, like I mentioned, in the social media footprint. We highlight that for customers so they know what they're dealing with. And both of these reports, the social media footprint and the social media surveillance, we place a level of analysis on that. So what that means is my team will look at that and make heads or tails out of the information that you're seeing. So we'll include a high-level summary of this is the information that we've gleaned out of this report, but these are some next steps that are probably pragmatic that you take in order to mitigate this risk or action it to the next level. Now, when I say the next level, the next level is obviously um, physical surveillance. Now, physical surveillance could be actually deploying an investigator real-time. Um, when you're monitoring through the social media surveillance product, we're able to get email alerts to our clients and to our team. So what that allows us to do is to deploy physical surveillance with pinpoint precision. So that obviously uh, results in time savings, but obviously cost savings as well. But in, in addition to physical surveillance, what we're seeing uh, present day with a lot of our clients, this could also be the beginning of an investigation. So this could be the start of 
getting together with your legal team or outside counsel to say, okay, what do we do now? We've gleaned this information. What do we do to take this to the next level? Or um, how do we go through this, that seek to understand conversation or that conversation with the employee and or group? Uh, this could be a high-risk termination. Uh, this could be interviews. This could be a computer forensics uh, case, et cetera, et cetera. This could be you just mitigating internally and watching the person a little bit closer. So those are the three uh, levels of products that we offer present day. Um, now, in terms of an application standpoint, um, we've seen this right from the rudimentary stage when clients are onboarding their respective employees. So from a human resource perspective, people are infusing this now into their uh, background search process, process. So in addition to doing criminal background searches, maybe credit searches, they're actually seeing what's going on on the internet. Like Lorenzo said, um, quite often those lines get blurred. So people, what they're doing on their own private time can quickly affect the workplace and become a huge brand implication. So before you actually put someone in a seat, it's really a good idea to, to go through uh, what do they have out there that's publicly available that could potentially be an implication to our company or our people? From a corporate risk perspective, that really runs the gamut. So we're seeing it from a theft and fraud perspective all the way through up to, to due diligence where people are saying, I want to get involved with this vendor, but I want to see what, they are, uh, what their fabric is on, on social media. Or I need to run a due diligence on someone that we're appointing to the C-suite, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, in the corporate space, um, the uses can be really widespread. I touched a little bit on due diligence, claims I touched through through the different products that we're offering, but claims can really be um, everything from a disability claim to an accident benefit claim, WSIB, uh, whatever the case may be. This might be a habitual uh, person that doesn't uh, show up to work on time and you want to see what this person's doing online because quite often we find that people are um, quite confidently posting things that they shouldn't be uh, online and it's very easy to get that information and then allows you to take it to the next level. In the counterfeiting space, we're using this quite a bit with very big brands which are um, on one end trying to figure out if there's uh, potential counterfeit products in the market space, but also um, are there vendors, etc., following SLA, standard level agreements that they have based in, uh, put in place? Are they following the rules and protocols of engagement, etc.? And then workplace violence, of course, uh, from a harassment set standpoint, whether it be sexual assault to high risk termination, to have that social media surveillance and monitoring the person on a 24 hour basis is really value add to clients because they can mitigate uh, in real time as opposed to after the fact. Lorenzo, you want to talk through some of the considerations uh, upon termination? Sure. So, uh, you know, in many cases, we'll, uh, we'll go to Craig and we'll say we have these issues. His team will do the, uh, will do the investigation, uh, we'll get information. And we have to make a determination after culling all of that information, after speaking with him and his team, do we have cause or don't we have cause? Now, as you well know, in, 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 in Canada, it's very difficult to, to prove cause. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult to prove cause uh, because you have to show, particularly in areas of social media, that there's been some real damage to the company in these circumstances. So when you're making that determination, you have to balance these interests. Some employers will say, and they'll come to me and say, look, we just want them out of here. We don't want them with the, with the company anymore. That shows poor judgment. We may not have cause, but we don't want them here anymore. One of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons why you might take that position and provide a package or an offer is because you actually buy disclosure, uh, a, a disclosure and a confidentiality agreement. So if, they, if it goes to litigation, a lot of what they've done may become public. This says you're going to not going to disclose any of this. You're not going to disclose any of the information. You're going to return all of the information, and you can address anything in the future from a social media perspective. That's really important because you're buying sanity. You're buying some protection by paying a little bit of money. You get your release. You get your undertakings. And they're actionable if they're breached. So if somebody says, I'm not going to tell anybody, and they go ahead and do it, my, my approach is over the last couple of years has been to go after them for a breach of, that, of those confidentiality obligations. Now, if you get things like um, bullying, harassment, extreme bullying, harassment, or cyber sabotage, or the unauthorized disclosure of confidential information, really important to companies these days in the competitive environment. Uh, that might be cause, but you have to know that if you're going to get, if you're going to allege cause, that employee or that individual may take you on, and you're going to have to prove your case. Right? Very important that we understand and we have all the information, and it's identifiable and quantifiable uh, from Craig's team, because that's going to be evidence. 
right? And he's going to be a witness and he's going to tell me how he got it. So we need to work together to make sure we've got the evidence. And along those lines, all the information that we mine through um, social media channels, whether it's using our products or having my investigator dig a little bit deeper, um, all that information is open source social media information. So I think that's a critical piece um, as well. We don't go behind the privacy walls. There's, there's methods to do that. That's old trade craft and law enforcement, but it really murkies and muddies the water. Yeah. So when we hand over our reports, whether it be to you or to Lorenzo's team, we make sure that those uh, reports are completely court admissible and airtight. And, and we want good evidence. We don't want evidence which is tainted because we want to use it to prove cause. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of cases which I think are really interesting. Uh, this is the Jones versus Psy case. This came out a couple of years ago, and it was at the Ontario Court of Appeal. Facts are really interesting because Jones worked for, for BMO. She had a personal account. Psy worked for BMO, different branch. They knew each other, right? Or they both worked for BMO, didn't know each other, but Psy was a common law uh, relationship with Jones' former husband. So now we're talking about getting murky, right? But Sai used her computer to get into the BMO systems and look at what Jones was doing at, at, at 174 occasions uh, over a couple of years. Now, I can tell you, I haven't looked at my bank account 174 times over the last couple of years. So what happened? Well, Jones brought an action and said, I want some remedy for your breach of my personal privacy by going into my records. The interesting thing here is that BMO did nothing wrong, right? It was Sai who did. So now you say, well, the employer's not liable. And the courts looked at it and said, well, how do we get some remedy for this person who had her privacy rights violated? So what they did is they came up with this uh, interesting new common law tort. A tort is just an actionable wrong. And it, they called it intrusion upon seclusion. All right? And there are the three elements, an intentional or reckless intrusion into private affairs, no lawful justification for the intrusion, and objectively, and that's the law, right, what a reasonable person would think, it was highly offensive and caused distress, humiliation, or anguish. They ordered uh, damages of $10,000, but said it could be up to a maximum of $20,000. And those aren't huge damages by legal liability um, uh, standards, but this was against the individual. It wasn't against BMO. It would have been, a, you know, it would have been, it, it would have been nothing to BMO, but these were against the individual. So BMO was found not to be liable at all, but the individual was. There are going to be cases where somebody alleges that the employer is involved, either by faulty policies or faulty uh, internal mechanisms to stop this. That wasn't the case here. So really interesting case. The next one is Whitmar, and this is a LinkedIn case, and this is what I mentioned earlier on. Uh, three employees left their employer to start a business. It's really hard to sue for damages when that happens. But there are, it, there are times when injunctive relief or damages are appropriate. But they started to compete uh, with their former employer by using client contact information. Well, what the employer found was that they had taken contact information from LinkedIn groups, which were private and invite only and not public. And that's how they were disseminating the fact that they were now in the new business. And the court found surprisingly, and I think this was actually fairly, a fairly modernistic approach, that the, the employer had a proprietary interest in the client contact information and granted an injunction with respect to the use of those contacts. So I thought that was remarkable. Um, the interesting thing about this case, too, is that if they had just gone on LinkedIn and said in their profile, their public profile, we've now moved, right? Here's where you can find us. Nothing an employer could probably do about that. But it's the way, it's like stealing the old Rolodex is what this is. And the courts recognize that. I'm not sure it completely gets you to where you want in terms of how social media really works, but it's an interesting attempt by the court to try to be with the, to go with the times. Uh, then we get to the Gameshi saga. Now, you've all heard about this. It was all over the media from October 4th, but I think the way it evolved is really important uh, from a legal perspective and, and how we deal with so social media. So CBC announces that it's parting ways with Gameshi. He goes, what does he do first? Because he is a social media hound. He goes on his Facebook page, and he says, I was fired over my sex life. So his is an aggressive forward strategy. I'm not going to wait for people to ask me. I'm going to say they did the wrong thing. Okay? So look at the numbers. His Facebook post had been liked 90,000 times, right, and shared 37,000 times, and had almost 22,000 comments the next morning. Okay? So Toronto Star goes on to publish the allegations, 
And there's a civil action now. We have employees and former employees and people he'd worked with come out of the woodwork and say, look, he did the same thing to me. It's sexual assault. But he brings a $55 million lawsuit against the CBC, which, you know, he later withdrew and had to pay $18,000 in costs. Why? Because he was a unionized employee. He could file a grievance. That's what the law says he has to do. Had to file a grievance. So that's ongoing, we don't know where that's at, but the lawsuit is gone. But we also know that he was now charged with sexual assault, all right, with five criminal charges. Bail said $100,000, he's now under house arrest. Interesting thing about these uh, criminal proceedings is that the Facebook post, because of what they charged him with, right, uh, the Facebook post could be used as evidence against them of admission of conduct which was not consensual, right? So it gets, it gets going to get really foggy, but this is a perfect modern-day example of how social media and employment law collide. Uh, real quick case from the U.S. This is an interesting Facebook case. The sheriff did not uh, refuse to re-employ employees who supported his opponent for re-election. And they liked, and the way they did that was like the opponent on Facebook campaign page, right? The court said that that's like a campaign sign in your front yard, and therefore, like is considered to be substantive speech. Now, I don't agree with that. To be honest with you, that's an American decision. I think in Canada we would have a different decision. But it shows you that the courts are going to look at areas where we have to figure out what, what, what this new media looks like in terms of how we deal with things like you know, loyalty to an employer. What comments are free speech? What are protected? Emoticons are next, I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> big emoticons. Right? Now, we know that that, that the obligation on an employer in, in Ontario, uh, we had legislation a few years back, it's all now part of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. You got to ensure a place, a workplace free of violence and harassment and bullying. We know that, that's the law. We have harassment policies, right? So before though we do, because there has been a tendency, and I get calls on this every week, that as soon as there's any comment, that we react by termination or by significant discipline, all right? We need to look at the posting, at the nature of the comments. Who did it go out to? Has there been any complaints? What's the context of the posting? All right? Has there been an apology? Has the employee done something to try to make it right? And is there any kind of um, public connection between the employer and the, co and, the, and the comment? So before you act, think about all of that. Okay? And I would add to that too, uh, Lorenzo, doing your homework around exactly how far spread is this post? Is there yeah, habitual the behavior? Is this going to, uh, you know, eventually um, hurt us 10 days down the road because this person is so habitual, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good point. So look, we talked about human rights earlier on. This Perez Moreno case is a good example, a recent case before the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, where um, the respondent posted, uh, called a fellow employee a dirty Mexican. Right, which is a discriminatory term. Right, it's based on his heritage. So the applicant's son saw the uh, uh, classmate saw the Facebook post, and it was brought to the attention of the human rights tribunal. Again, the employer not directly involved in this, right? But it was an, it was in the employment context. So what does the employer do with respect to the person who made the comment? So those actions were found to be harassment in the workplace, contrary to the human rights code. Very interesting case. Right. So let's talk about best practices, and that way we can, we can end off on a, on a positive note. First of all, define the social, no social networking for your company, and it includes specific rules for use. What do, you want to, what do you want out of it? Do you want to have an active populace that goes out and spreads the word of the company? Do you want something more defensive, only used in certain circumstances, all right? And, and make a, a real distinction between the private and the public. Address non-work usage of social media. That should be part of your, uh, of your policy. It should say things like conduct which is, uh, that undermines our, our values is not permitted, even if it's on personal time, if it connects us with the company. All right? So make sure that they know and that they understand that information on social media never goes away. Craig will tell you that. You can, you know, it's, it's in the ether somewhere. All right? And absolutely no commentary on company issues without authorization. Yeah, and we've found that um, a lot of people have fallen into that trap where they believe that they've taken down a post or um, a picture for whatever reason. Um, and through that social media surveillance product, we've got that captured in time forever, to Lawrence's point.
So again, with the policy, it's got to say that you don't, you can never disclose proprietary or confidential information. That's a no. That's major discipline and termination if they do that. Make them aware of copyright and other legal issues because copyright, secrets that get out, right, that you know within, within the culture of your company might be copyrighted. Those issues might be copyrighted. They can't get out. You have to say that we expect you to comply with all of our policies and the law of Canada. Okay? Let them know that there will be discipline if there's improper use. We can, we can talk specifically about harassment, but any improper use. And have a person in your organization, any, and I know we can't always, you know, some organizations are smaller, but is the go-to person. Let's call all that into one person so we can manage the, the information, manage the issue, manage the fallout. Really important that we understand that there's going to be fallout with employees for any discipline as a result of a social media policy breach. We need to manage that because they're in our workforce. So some practical, ti practical tips. Make sure the policies address confidentiality and acceptable conduct. Really, really got to be clear about this. You got to communicate what's acceptable, give them notice of the policy, and be consistent in applying the policies. You can't treat one employee different than the other, or you will undermine the effectiveness of your policy with all employees. All right? Consistency is incredibly important. It doesn't mean that everybody is, is, gets the same result. It means that the process is consistent, that you're applying the policies consistent, and you come to a decision based on those policies and your process. All right? Establish the process for addressing social networking concerns, and if discipline is appropriate, then do it. And then we'll just wrap up. I mean, just to provide some value to, uh, to this webinar audience, if you do come across any social media investigations or anything where you're navigating through this for the first time, now Lorenzo talked through having that really strong policy and those internal protocols, et cetera, but have a strong support system either internally or on the outside where you can mine social media very quickly and get the information that you need so that you can act based on that strong social media policy. So we're going we're gonna to leave you with our contact information, and just feel free to reach out, even if you need some advice, et cetera. We're happy to talk uh, people through uh, whatever you're dealing with, and we're both very passionate about this subject as we see it growing by leaps and bounds over the next coming years. We've also got a website there at the bottom that you can visit. It highlights a little bit more about what we do from a social media perspective, but also talks you through some of the common uses of social media, mining, whether you're doing it through us or by yourself, some frequently asked questions, uh, either from the courts or clients, et cetera. Um, so it should give you a good holistic viewpoint of how you go ahead and initiate a social media investigation. So along those li that lines, we're going we're gonna to open it up for questions. We have about uh, nine minutes um, on the clock, and we're happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you may have right now. Thanks, Greg. Lorenzo, maybe I can throw one at you. Um, so we talked a little bit about social media policy. What do you think the best way for the attendees on this webinar to actually go ahead and initiate a, uh, the dialogue to start that conversation to come up with a social media policy? So it's a good question. I think first, understand your culture understand what you do, understand how you want to use social media. Um, there are all kinds of great templates. The writing isn't the issue. The issue is the content. So what do you need out of this policy? Um, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It has to hit all those points we talked about. Right? You have to give notice. It has to be show what's good and what's bad, what, what, what is permissible, what's, uh, what's impermissible. Um, most importantly, it has, to, it has to give employees enough information upon which to make a decision on when and how they use social media as it relates to the workplace. And that can be pretty simple. But go back to, if you, if you go back to when you were drafting harassment policies, for example, you know, the, the, the calculus on this isn't much different. You use the same protocols, but you've got to understand first what you need out of this policy before you draft it, or you'll never get it done properly. Right. And how important is it to um, involve different levels of the organization? Because I would assume that this wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all no, you need to be not. pragmatic of yeah. what the different levels of employees are yeah. using this for. Absolutely. Like, like if you're a technology company, you're going to be a big, big user of social media with both, both, as a, both corporately and, and, and with your employees. And, but you're going to have to get uh, input from everyone.
everybody to say, well, we understand that, uh, you know, that social media is important, but we also need to understand what the rules are. So everybody should have a seat at the table on that, at least so you understand what they're thinking. I'll give you an example. Uh, Walmart, for years, has had an incredible intranet, and that is open for all employees to use and have discussions on issues which are relevant to Walmart. They came up against a real uh, difficult issue when people started talking about unionization, right? There's nothing illegal about talking about unionization, but Walmart may not like them doing uh, that. So how does your company deal with that? Like, how do you deal with situations where people are starting to kind of color outside the lines? Those are the kind of things that you need input from all of the groups so you know what going in, how you're going to deal with those situations. Yeah, that's a good point. I think intranets are so commonplace now. People Absolutely. are work sharing across different platforms, et cetera, and that's where you really fall back on your social media policy uh, because the parameters are the same and the rules of engagement are going to be the same. Yeah, and, and the other big issue that comes up after, particularly after termination, is what information, because social media is used off of phones now, right? So what information should the people have on company phones or private phones, right. whether they're contacts, whether they're social media use, that we can retrieve following a termination of employment. Yeah. It gets Absolutely. really, really foggy. Yeah. What's private? What, you know, or is it on your server? Is it on another server? How do we determine what we can get? Yeah, that's a good point. I know um, in our experience in, in running some of these investigations on the tail end, doing that computer forensics part, we always ask our clients, what's your social media policy? so that we know what parameters to navigate through so that we don't get into exactly. those murky waters. There you go. If there's no other questions, we're going to leave you with our contact information. We will be sending out a, a questionnaire as well, so if there are any questions that you want to uh, get across to Lorenzo and myself offline, uh, feel free to do that, and we're happy to walk you through uh, any challenges or questions that you may have. Great. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time this afternoon, everyone. Really appreciate it.